Rage on that beat, going crazy. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, the Solano Stallions podcast. My name is Carter Scott, as always, joined by my co host Justin Brown. And today we have a fantastic interview with Coach Bill Millis, head coach at Salesian. He's won multiple state titles, multiple Coach of the Year awards, and has worked with some of the best basketball minds in the world. It really is a great interview with a fantastic basketball mind and an even better person. So let's get right into it, our interview with Coach Bill Millis. All right, joining us today on the pod is the one and only Coach Bill Millis. Coach, how are you doing today? Good, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on with us. Um, so first off, I just want to start. I know um, you and my co-host here, Justin, are, uh, are you guys know each other, you have a past. Um, so I know he helps you coach now, and I know you coached him in the past. So can you tell me, um, how is he as a coach today, and how was he to co- how how was it coaching him in the past also? Sure. So um, so yeah. So coach coach uh, J- JB and I go back uh, quite some time. I actually knew Coach Brown um, uh, when he was uh, before he came to Salesian because he was actually a camper uh, at my basketball camp. So that's where I first kind of got to know him, and uh, then he came to Salesian and played for us. Uh, he was a, a three-year varsity player. He was a very good basketball player. Um, you know, to coach him, I, it's funny. I, I joke with our team about, you know, different things about his game and stuff like that. But to be completely honest with you, uh, he, he was actually really easy to coach because, one, he came from a very good family and had good values and all those types of things. Two, he was a good student, which is important to us. Mm-hmm. Um and three, he was a good player. I mean, he worked on his game. He was, we had had uh, some other players go on to play D1 before him. Um, but they had, like, for example, one went to a, a JC first and then went D1. I think Justin was our first player to ever go straight to a Division One out of our program when he graduated. And he obviously had a good uh, career in college and, and played up in Canada for a while. And uh, he's just, was, has been really, uh, you know, a good a good person to have around as a coach. He's a really good coach too. He relates to the players really well and all that stuff. So I see him. You know, he's he's probably thinking, man, is he going to throw out any dirt on me and anything? <laughs> no, he's, he's great to have around. He's a really good coach, and he was he was fun to coach when I had him. So very nice see i'm, I'm see that, i'm glad i asked the question now because we got these <laughs> nice words out of you and i'm sure i pre- appreciate the nice you. words <laughs> <laughs> you <pay me> later. <laughs> all right um more more back to you a little bit now um so can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you kind of found basketball and ended up choosing basketball as your path sure so um well i've been asked this question before and i'm i'm going to preface it with a couple things one i'm going to say that um there's this, you know, phenomenon or whatever you want to call it. Some people use the phrase, things happen for a reason. Some people say God, you know, had a plan or whatever. All of those things kind of uh, play into my past, I think, because of the route that uh, got me to where I am now. Um, So sorry if I, sorry if I take long answering this question. I promise I won't answer all all your questions this long. But um, I also want to preface the answer by, by telling a quick little history of uh, Pete Newell. Pete Newell is uh, one of the greatest basketball minds of all time. He uh, he uh, is the only person, the only coach in basketball history to win, to coach a national championship, uh, to also win an NIT championship, and to win a an Olympic gold medal, all as as coach as a coach. Uh, in 1949, he won the NIT with USF. The NIT tournament back then was the, the big tournament. Then in 1959, he won the NCAA tournament with Cal, and then he won the 1960 Olympic gold medal, which uh, had players like Oscar Robertson, Jerry West, Jerry Lucas. They were considered to be the best team ever assembled until 92 when the Dream Team was created. But 
Um, he's the only player, he's the only person to ever win all three of those things. And if you've ever been to a Cal basketball game, you can see his, his name on the court. It's named after him. And the reason why I bring him up is there's um, a, a long history between the Newell family and the Mellis family. And so this goes back to uh, when I was growing up in Santa Cruz, uh, my dad uh, had, had gone to Cal. And so I was a big Cal fan growing up, went to all the football games, basketball games. I saw the 1982 big game play where they tossed the ball around in person. That was, that was cool. But anyway, um, my dad, when he was at Cal in the 50s, was a student manager for Pete Newell. And then Pete Newell's son, Pete Newell Jr., ended up in Santa Cruz as the coach at Santa Cruz High, where he coached for 30 plus years. And so my brother and I got to play for Pete Newell Jr., uh, which was, you know, awesome. And so, um, you know, growing up, uh, I always wanted to go to Cal. Uh, I was a really good student. I got into Cal. That was my dream. And uh, when I went to Cal, uh, Coach Newell Jr. said to me, hey, why don't you be a student assistant for the basketball team? And I was like, sure. I mean, my brother, my older brother actually did that at UC Davis as well. So I guess you could say my brother and I were both kind of following our dad's footsteps. But um, so I go to Cal. And I worked with the men's basketball team for five years. Uh, my last year there was Jason Kidd's freshman year. So we overlapped by a year. That was a really fun experience. We beat Duke in the NCAA tournament, went to the Sweet 16. Duke was the back-to-back -back national champs at that time. So we're talking about 1993. Um, but my first year at Cal, uh, one of the assistant coaches was a guy by the name of Bill Tressler. And Bill Tressler uh, and I really hit it off. And he ended up uh, going, you know, to a bunch of different places as a coach in, on the college level, but he ended up at Salesian uh, in 93, the year that I was graduating. And so we always stayed in touch and he said to me, hey, why don't you come be my assistant? So I went and helped him and I was an assistant coach for him for five years. And then he stepped down and went back into the college game. And that's when I took over in, in 1998 uh, as uh, PE teacher as well as the head coach and now I've been there 20 you know three years so that was the long version to this phenomenon of all these things kind of fell into place if I if my dad and coach Newell didn't have a connection you know I don't know that I would have had the same connection with with coach Newell Jr. and then certainly that helped getting the job at Cal and then I would have that didn't happen I would have never met Bill Tressler and you know so on and so forth so you know, to have Coach Newell in my life and Coach Tressler in my life and, and Coach Campanelli, who was the, the coach at Cal. I mean, those are my three mentors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just been kind of a blessing to get me to where, I, where I've been to. And I, I've been able to stay in touch with all three of them uh, all throughout my coaching career. I imagine like having, having those, like you said, those three great basketball minds. I imagine having that around you all the time, you must have absorbed a lot from them. Well, I certainly uh, learned a lot from all of them. Um, certainly you know, Coach Newell growing up, I mean, he was just an amazing high school basketball coach. And then I learned so much from Coach Campanelli, um, just in terms of X's and O's. And, uh, you know, he was really a, a defensive guru, to be honest with you. And, uh, and then Coach Tressler, you know, he gave me my first job and, and he really taught me, in my opinion, um, you know, how to, how to relate to the players and, and, how to kind of really run a program, to be honest with you. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I mean, to have those three resources, uh, I go to dinner with Coach Tressler all the time and we stay in touch. He's local. Uh, Coach Campanelli is 81 now, and I call him all the time and talk basketball. And we, you know, go to dinner, not so much during COVID, but yeah. we go to dinner a lot and see each other. And, and uh, Coach Newell, I talk to almost all the time, like almost every week. I mean, he lives in Las Vegas now and he's retired. And so just to have those three guys, it's just, it's been a true blessing to be honest with you. That's awesome. You know, you, you kind of might've already answered my question, but um, I was going to ask, what do you, wait, first of all, will you have like six, 700 career wins somewhere in there? Some, a lot. Some, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, my question, my question was who or what do you credit uh, the most to all those wins that you have in your basketball career? Um, 
uh, man, I mean, we've, we've had so many good players. I mean, you were the first, like I said, well, uh, my assistant, my other assistant coach, well, we have four assistant coaches, uh, David Job, one of our former coach players, Joe. he was the first one to go D1. He went, he went and played at DBC for two years and then played at UC Riverside. Um, but, you know, we've had, I think, I think the list is almost up to 50 now former players that have played college basketball on some level, whether that's division one, division two, NAIA, uh, you know, uh, JC. So, I mean, you know, we've had probably, I don't know, 15 D one guy, probably more. I can't even know off the top of my head. We've had such awesome players. I mean, that first and foremost, the coaches don't win the games. The players do, you know, that, um, but the other thing is, you know, we've had stability in our, in our coaching staff and, Besides JV and Coach Job that I just referred to, Jermaine Edmonds, who's a former player of ours, who was an unbelievable basketball player and terrific coach. And then Eddie Foster, he's he's like the godfather. He he and I were <laughs> assistant coaches together for Tressler. And I mean, he's been my assistant coach for all 23 years. So I mean, you know, we have an unbelievable staff. And so I mean, yeah, I, I get credit for the wins, but you guys know everyone does the work and everyone gets the credit. Yeah. That is that is a that is a pretty big flex though when when someone says how many wins do you have six hundred seven hundred somewhere on there and you don't even know the you don't even know the number that that is a flex I will say it's somewhere in there <laughs> so I know I know um you were voted coach of the year and so um can you tell me how it felt uh, receiving that kind of award and how special you kind of hold that to you and what if you think it reflects uh on your program or on you and and how that made you feel. Um, so, you know, first of all, I'll answer that two ways. First of all, personally, um, you know, when I won the, I mean, I've won a few coach of the year awards, but my favorite one is probably the California coaches association. That was the state coach of the year in 2017. Um, and the thing that was cool about that is that, um, that, that list of former coaches that have won that award is, is people that I really look up to. I mean, this is going way back to Frank Laporte, Mike Phelps, Frank Alaco, Don Lippi, who I think also just got recently inducted into their Hall of Fame, Peter Diepenbrock, my high school coach. Um, back in like, I, I want to say 2005 or so, um, my, my high school coach got, a, uh, got inducted into the California Coaches Hall of Fame. And uh, the the evening what happens at these at these award ceremonies is all of the coach of the year awards get called up and they receive a plaque and it's pretty quick but the hall of fame members actually get to speak and there's someone that presents them and all that stuff and uh, he asked me to present him and this is at a time where I was early in my coaching career and uh, I got to go and present him and um, his dad Pete Newell Sr. also was receiving a lifetime achievement award at the same event. So I have this, like, uh, I have this, it's my most prized possession. Um, I have a picture on my wall that's a picture from that night of me, my brother, my dad, my, our high school coach, and Pete Newell Sr. It's probably my most prized possession. I mean, my dad's, you know, passed away a long time ago, and so did Pete Newell. So to have that is really awesome. But to win the award, I think just it's, it's really kind of special to be in this, mentioned in the same category. But the true answer to the question is that, that award goes back to what I said earlier. It's just, you know, one, I've done it for a long time. And two, we've had really amazing players over the years. So you don't win those types of things without having, you know, a bunch of people in your corner that help you along the way, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, besides myself, obviously, <laughs> but um, I mean, you've coached guys like, uh, Jabari Bird, Jabari Brown, those are two NBA guys. Uh, DA, Dominic Artis, uh, Desmond, James Akinjo, uh, the twins, the McClanahan twins. Um, just what, what's one thing that you would say those guys have in common? What, like that made, made them successful? I mean, just a drive, you know, it's, um, it's that intangible that you can't, that you really can't coach. You know, 
we don't take credit for that as coaches. I mean, we, we push them and try to maximize their potential, but the reality is um, all of those guys you just mentioned, they're in the gym, you know, hours upon hours upon hours, way more than just the time that we have them in our practice or in the off season or whatever. I mean, those guys just all had a drive that, that is just, you know, you can't, you can't teach, to be honest with you. It's just one of those, just one of those things, you know. So I went to, I went to a small school in the Central Valley, um, established in 2008. So the farthest I ever got to watch uh, my school's team go was round one of like the local playoffs. And so I know, I know you have, you have a, a, a few state titles under your belt. Um, can you give us an insight into like what it takes to make a run like that? And uh, coaching and player wise, what was the toughest part of that? And how did it feel when it all came together? Um, so, yeah, we've, we've won two. We've played in the game one other time. So we've been able to play in it three times. And actually, we were one game away from going uh, on numerous occasions also. So uh, I think the first thing I'll say is just it's so tough to get there. So many things have to fall into place. Um, so to get there is special. Uh, I think we really try not to focus too much on that actual game versus the process to get there. Mm. Um, you don't get there unless you have a lot of things that happen for you. There, there is a little bit of luck, but there's, you know, a lot of work ethic, a lot of buy-in from the players. Um, you obviously have to have skilled guys and guys that uh, are willing to, you know, play at both ends of the floor. Um, so it's, it's definitely a process. Um, you know, to win it twice is, is just been, it was so much fun. I can't even tell you how much fun it was. Uh, at the same time, you know, like those games are kind of um, leading up to it are really a lot of pressure, a lot of, it's really nerve wracking and uh, it's in a lot of ways, not that much fun um, because I think for us as coaches, we just want it so bad for our players that we just don't, we don't want to make a mistake as coaches. That, that cost us, you know, a game or whatever, but uh, it's definitely special. Um, when, when you achieve it, it's just the most fun and the celebration is just, you know, incredible. The first time we won it was on a buzzer beater and we won by one. So, I mean, that was just a wild, wild time when coach Brown, when JB was playing, um, you know, we were, we were basically two seconds away from going to the state game and a guy hit a three pointer with, you know, a great defender with a hand in his face that, yeah. you know, practically banked in. I mean, it was a prayer, Man. kind of a prayer shot. I mean, mm -hmm. he stepped up and made a shot. But I mean, you know, we, it's just one of those things that you got to have a little bit of luck along the way, you know. When, when you have something like that happen, like when, when a player hits a prayer and you're two seconds away, how do you handle that in the locker room after? Like, what, what do you say to your players? Like, because you were that close and to something – like you said, hand in his face, there's literally nothing you could have done better to defend it. How does that locker room feel after? And how do you kind of coach your players after that? Well, you don't, I mean, at the end of the season, you, you try to reflect on the entire season, not just that moment. Mm -hmm. um, in that particular game, you know, we were, we were up six or eight points late in the game and we made mm -hmm. a series of turnovers and, mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't that one play. I mean, we, we lost the game because of a series of plays. So you don't, you know, you don't talk too much about that one play. I really, I think just talked more about the entire season and mm -hmm. how proud we were of them. That was the first time we had ever gone that far. Um, we, we walked into the gym, we were playing uh, Sacred Heart Cathedral. Mm -hmm. This is uh, 2006 and uh, Sacred Heart Cathedral girls were playing before us. And I remember thinking, oh, man, we're going to walk into this gym and their gym is going to be packed with Sacred Heart Cathedral Green. And I'll never forget, we walked in. I don't know if you remember this, JB. We walked in just to sit in the bleachers and, and wait. And there was this incredible roar mm -hmm. that I heard. Everyone was walking ahead of me. And I heard this roar. And I thought something was happening in the game, uh, the girls game. And I look in and we're like getting this standing ovation. We were, we were just walking to the gym just to – so yeah, I couldn't believe how many people were in the stands and everyone was wearing red. It was a lot of fun. I mean, those games are yeah. really a lot of fun. I don't know if you remember that, JB. 
No, yeah, that that game was fun, and that was that was really tough. That uh, at the end when we lost that one because we had like like six or seven seniors. Yeah, was, yeah, it was that locker room was tough for sure. That was your. That was my sophomore year. Sophomore year, right? Yeah, yeah. two thousand eight. So yeah, um, yeah, that was a tough pill to swallow. We had a yeah, it was tough. Really fun group of seniors that had really paved the way, and then you added some younger guys like like Justin, who just you know really made it such a fun experience. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so I know from playing for you and coaching with you. Um, your emphasis on the details of the game, um, both the details of the game and defense. And um, probably the best thing I liked about your coaching, besides you pushing me the way you did, was you making me play defense. Um, just because once I went to the next level, um, I felt like I was a step ahead of everybody else. Um, just because a lot of coaches don't really preach it the way you do um, in practice and in games and all that in high school. Um, so I guess my question to you is why um, are the details so important uh, to your coaching style? 100% I got that from Coach Newell. Uh, that's how he was. He was – he's so detail-oriented. Um, and I remember, you know, just – I remember – in some practices, uh, he used to choose the latest practice time. And so there was no, there was no, <laughs> nobody <didn't> after. <laughs> and there were times where we'd stay late if we just didn't get it right. He'd like, nope, do it again, do it again. And, and uh, you know, he, he told me once early on in my coaching career, don't be afraid to blow the, let, let me put it this way. Some coaches, some coaches, uh, if something happens in practice, they just let it go and they, they let practice go on because they don't want to disrupt the flow of practice. He told me early on in my coaching career, don't be afraid to blow the whistle at that moment to correct the mistake because that's when it's going to be fresh in their minds. And so, you know, you know, I mean, we all do this, you know, Coach Job and you and, uh, you know, Coach Foster will blow the whistle at any point in practice just to correct a mistake that happened right there and then because it's so important to fix it right at that moment and not worry about putting a stop to practice for that moment. Mm -hmm. and, and the defensive part, I mean, you know, I, I, don't know where I, I don't know where I learned that, but, I mean, just – I just think, again, playing for Coach Newell. Coach, Coach Campanelli was an awesome – defensive coach, same with coach Tressler. So I've, I've had three kind of defensive coaching mentors, but uh, to be honest, I, I just kind of learned early on, maybe way back when I was a player that you're going to have, you're going to have nights where the ball isn't going in the basket for you. You're going to struggle some nights on the offensive end of the court, but if you play good, good team, team defense, uh, you're always going to be in the game, whether your offense is clicking or not. I mean, that has to be, the consistent part of your team is at the defensive end of the court. Yeah, and definitely coaches know Salesian for their defense. And um, kids coming into Salesian, um, I tell them all the time, if you don't play defense, you're not going to play. That's just how it is. That's what I was told when I first got there. If I don't play defense, I'm not going to play, no matter how talented I am. So well, that's just always – and you learned to take charges. <laughs> I did. You were good at it. I did. I was. You were really good <laughs> at it. I, mean, I had, would, I would a walk of, a lot of people over myself on <laughs> offense. But <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I probably averaged at least about three or four charges a game. But <laughs> I would just run people over. But I would step in and I would take a charge. And that's honestly probably what got me to the next level um, because AAU, I was stepping in taking charges and coaches were loving that. And like I said, once I got to the next level, I just felt like I was a step ahead of everybody because I knew where to be on defense, how to play defense, all that. So that's definitely, like I said, one of the best things I definitely took from you uh, 
coming up. So. And now you teach it. And now I teach it. Okay. You and Coach Job, the defensive coach, <laughs> Coach Edmonds, has all you guys all. That's that's you know Carter. That's one of the great things about having former players as coaches is they know mm-hmm. you know what what you expect. And I, I I can't even emphasize this enough. Those those guys do so much in practice. It's it really kind of makes it easy for me as a coach to be honest with you. All right. Uh, last couple of questions for you here, coach, as we uh, start to wrap things up. Um, do you have a favorite uh, moment or memory uh, in your years from basketball? Um, man, that's, that's tough. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll name two. Uh, one's a personal one and then one's more of a team one, but um, the personal one is, is when we won our first, state championship um not because we won i mean that was incredible and we like i said we won on a buzzer beater and it was just the most incredible play um but uh, when i was in high school um the vice principal at my school was a woman by the name of marie ashita and um I, our family was close to her and i was my brother was a student body president when i was growing up then i was student body president when i was senior uh, but she had already moved on and she ended up uh, being a principal in Carmel, but then she ended up being the CIF executive director. Mm. And so she's at the game and the person that oversees basketball for the CIF is a gentleman who I can't remember his name, but he's the one that's out there presenting the trophies and all this stuff. So I'll never forget. And I had seen her before the game and said, hi, but I'll never forget when they call the coach out to go, uh, get the trophy. She had walked out to center court and whispered something to the gentleman. Basically, she said, "Let me present this one." So, uh, here's our first state title. It's the pinnacle of our, you know, coaching, you know, career and our players and everything. And and uh, and she goes out there to present the trophy. So that was really cool. So I have a really cool picture of her presenting the trophy to to me and to our team. Um, But I would say maybe one of my favorite moments, to be honest, and JB was part of this, was um, the 2005-2006 season when, again, he was a sophomore. Earlier in that year, we took a trip to Hawaii. And uh, it was probably my favorite. I mean, we've taken some really awesome trips, but it's probably my favorite trip. I mean, we we, uh, played in the Punahou tournament. It was the first really major trip that we took um, like this. Um, we actually started fundraising for it the summer before, and uh, we raised somewhere around fifty thousand dollars for our basketball wow. program, and uh, it allowed for a lot of families to go. I remember we flew out there on Christmas Day, and not only did the coaches go, but we had our coaches' families and players and players' families. We had an awesome Christmas dinner that had seventy-three people at it. It was wow. just all the people that either were already in Hawaii or met us there or traveled with us or whatever. I mean, uh, JB, your entire family went, a lot of the players' families went. That was just so much fun. We were out there for a week. We did a lot of sightseeing, a lot of fun things. But then in the tournament, we ended up winning the tournament on a buzzer beater. (laughs) On a buzzer beater. (laughs) In overtime, I think it was. Was that right? I think it was in overtime. David Singleton hit a (laughs) three-pointer. We were down two, I think. Uh, we had the ball under the basket with two seconds. And, I mean, it's just the perfect way to cap the, the trip. But it was just – I would say that trip kind of was, was really what uh, – is one of, my, one of my favorite moments, I would say. Yeah, that trip was, was so much fun. Uh, the other thing is we had a, we had a, a student that was – we knew we were going to be good that year. And we had a student that was uh, – filming us all year he had we gave him unlimited access locker room everything we chronicled the season and he made a three dvd set at the end of the year that we sold as a fundraiser um and he got to keep some of the money and we got to keep some of the money for our program it wasn't even really about the money as much as having that chronicled so every once in a while i'll pull that out and and pop it in and and watch (laughs) watch some scenes from that that season it was fun yeah, it was so much fun. I, I thought you were going to say um, we went to Orlando and we played in that five overtime game. Well, you know, that's up there too. <laughs> like, that Was that your senior That was my senior year, I think. 
Yeah, senior year. I think senior year. Uh, yeah, we played in a, in a tournament in Orlando, Florida, and we won 100 and, 112 to 107. Eesh. Five, Five overtimes. Yeah. <laughs> they what well. they ended they ended the game with three people, was it? Yeah, they so many people had fouled out. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I, wow. shoot, I fouled out the first overtime. Did you <laughs> yeah. you, and, you and about eight other players? We had everybody. I mean, it was it was a wild game. That was a fun game. That was fun. Um well my last question for you is due to COVID. Do you think we will be playing this season? Boy, if you would have asked me that two months ago, I would have said, yeah, definitely. I know. Now they yeah. put a whole new restriction on it and everything. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, – I, I think we will. I think I think we're headed, obviously, in the right direction with, with the vaccine. Uh, I actually just heard something today that they're saying the vaccine may come to the – general public by as early as March or late February, whereas before they were anticipating more like April. So um, will it be a full season? It's hard to say. Uh, Football was supposed to start a few days ago on Monday. They've obviously pushed that back. Um, I don't know. I I think we're going to have a season. I just don't know if it'll start on the March 15th date that they – Originally anticipating, said, yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I hope we do. I mean, yeah, I think uh, just for especially for this year's seniors, yeah, in, in all sports, not just basketball, but I just I, yeah. I feel bad for, you know, I feel bad for baseball players last year that didn't get to have their senior year, mm-hmm. or yeah. seniors last year that didn't really get to have graduation or prom or grad night, and just really tough. I, I just I hope that we get to have some sort of season. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well. Coach, thank you so much for hopping on. That was that was really great. You gave us a lot of insight and uh, a great history lesson into your background and all this other <laughs> stuff. And and hopefully you keep uh, Justin honest at practice. Keep him. Make sure he's uh he's working that whistle. Oh, he he's always he's always working the whistle. And, and I just want to say, you guys, this is a really cool uh, thing that you guys are doing. I've I've watched all your uh, all your episodes so far, and just to you okay. know, bring uh, some some notoriety to the, to the area and there's Solano County having, you know, the history that it has. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think the guys are doing a good job with us, with the stallions and the fact that you guys can add this dimension to it is really cool. So uh, you've had some good people on so far and I've listened to all of them. And, uh, it's been a pleasure to be here with you guys. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, yeah, I appreciate, really you, appreciate you, Coach Mellis. Yeah. All right, Coach yeah. Mellis. Thanks again. Uh, hopefully we'll have you on soon. We'd love to have you back on again. Anytime. You just name it. Anytime. All right. That was Coach Bill Millis, kind enough to give us a slice of his schedule to talk. He shared some great insights for a lot of younger guys looking to take that next step along with some fantastic stories. Really enjoyed having him on the pod and would love to get him back soon. Thank you all for watching and listening to this week's pod. If you have anyone you want featured, whether it's a player, coach, or member of the community, don't hesitate to reach out to us on our social channels at Solano Stallions. Follow us there on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully you decide to join us again next time. And if you do, we'll see you then. Thank you.